Welcome to uh, Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Todd Kohling, and it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Abbas Batar uh, as our speaker today. He's going to be speaking about LVAD therapy in 2023, which patients and when. Abbas um, uh, has been on our, our faculty since 2017. He, he obtained his initial training as under, undergraduate in medical school at the American University in Beirut, in Lebanon, uh, came to the United States and um, uh, got his residency training at the University of Indiana, followed by a cardiology fellowship at um, the University of Louisville. After that, we were fortunate to match him into our advanced heart failure and transplant training program as a fellow and at the end of that year, it was obvious that we wanted him on our faculty. He said yes. And uh, since then, Abbas has been a, a fantastic faculty member for us. Um, he really is a um, uh, master clinician, uh, both for advanced heart failure, transplant, and also for general cardiology. He's taken a leadership role with the um, mitral and tricuspid uh, valve program with the structural team, and also recently has a, uh, uh, taken a, a leadership program within uh, the uh, ambulatory heart uh, uh, LVAD program and uh, pushing forward quality measures uh, in that group. So uh, again, Abbas, thank you uh, for joining us. Cenk, thank you for your talk today. Um, thank you. Dr. Colley, thank you for those uh, really kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present today um, at the Cardiovascular Grand Round. So today I'll be talking about uh, LVAD therapy, uh, how to identify those patients, when to refer those patients. And at the end of my talk, I'll briefly talk about outcomes uh, and what the future holds in terms of MCS. So as you all as you are all aware, heart failure is a very common disease. It is estimated that close to six million Americans have heart failure, and about half of the patient will die within five years from diagnosis. And you know, for the patients that we see often in our clinics, those with advanced heart failure, almost a quarter to a half of those patients will die within a year, which is pretty high. And you know, historically, when we see those patients, we you know use the ACTHA staging system and the NOHA classification. And when we talk about patients with advanced heart failure, we talk about patients with NOHA class three, B, and four mainly. However, you know, this includes a very heterogeneous group of patients. A better a better tool to use to stratify those patients will be to use the Intermax which stands for the Interagency Registry for Mechanically Assisted Circulatory Support. And it stratified those patients with class three to four heart failure to seven profile, from one to seven. So profile seven will be a patient you know, with NOHA class three, profile one would be someone with critical cardiogenic shock who will need an intervention within hours. To simplify this classification, usually patient on anotropic support will fall between profile one and three, and then the rest are pretty much ambulatory heart failure patients with some advanced features. Now, if you look into you know, how prevalent advanced heart failure is, so this is you know, based on some statistical modeling, it is estimated that almost 250 to 300,000 patients have class 3B or 4 advanced heart failure, and those are younger than 75 years old. And theoretically, all those patients could be candidates for advanced therapies. And as of today, the gold standard for treatment for advanced heart failure remains heart transplantation. And if we look into the number of transplants in North America, which is here in the blue bar, it hasn't changed much over the last couple of decades. So we have been performing somewhere between 3,000, 3,500 transplants in the United States. However, over the last couple of years, we've seen a slight increase in the number of heart transplants we're doing, mainly uh, by using older heart partially using hep C donors and uh, using doing DCD or death after cardio uh, circulatory uh, okay, support. Now to fill this gap between you know, the, the need for heart transplant and the number of patients who needs one, you know, MCS filled this gap or tried to fill this gap over the last few decades. And here we can see over the last uh, 
12, 13 years, we have seen initially a steady increase in the number of LVAD that has been implanted in the United States. And this number kind of plateaued right now. We've been performing somewhere between 3,000 to 3,500 VAD per year. Initially, you know, we've had the HeartMate 2, which is here in the purple bar. And then with the introduction of the HVAD, you know, we've seen like some phasing out of the HeartMate 2. And eventually, currently, HeartMate 3 is the only commercially available pump. Um, now, we cannot talk about triggers for heart failure referral without talking about uh, the clinical course for heart failure. So heart failure is a progressive disease, and um, with each hospitalization or each decompensation, patients lose some of their cardiac reserve and their quality of life, and they will never go back to their baseline when compared to pre-hospitalizations. And in a small subset of patients, they just go into this vicious loop, like where they will keep sliding and keep having frequent hospitalizations. And it's very important to identify those patients at the beginning of the slope, because identifying them too late Identifying them late in here, you know, they could have missed their window to be evaluated for advanced heart failure therapies. Now, different uh, markers or triggers have been identified and reported in the literature. Like, you know, when would you refer somebody for advanced therapies? You know, people have published about clinical, laboratory imaging, hemodynamics, functional assessments. People came up with all sorts of composite score. So for the coming 15 minutes, I will go over some of the triggers that we would use often and easily in our day-to-day -day practice, whether in clinic or you know, on the inpatient side. So starting with clinical marker, the one of the strongest clinical marker for advanced heart failure would be heart failure hospitalization. And this data was taken from the CHARM trials, which had close to 7,500 patients. Almost two thirds of those patients had uh, a low ejection fraction less than 40%. And here we can see that the risk of dying is the highest after the heart failure hospitalization. So within a month post hospitalization, you know, the risk of dying is the highest and it drops over time, but it will never go back to baseline. So, you know, despite, you know, two years of follow-up, those patients continue to be at a high risk of dying because of heart failure. And here we can see a strong correlation between the frequency of hospitalizations and the duration of hospitalization. They do strongly correlate with outcome. And to, you know, this is a busy slide to put things in perspective, I'm gonna take two patient profile. Let's take this first curve. This would be a patient profile who presented for his first hospitalization and stayed for a short period of time at the hospital, let's say seven days. So here we can see at one month of follow-up, the risk is almost fourfold higher than baseline and drops slowly over time, but never goes back to zero. And if we take another extreme, and this is a patient who had like three heart failure hospitalizations and has been in the hospital for like over three weeks. His odds of dying because of heart failure within the first month is like 16 times higher and it drops over time, but remains high upon follow up. Other clinical marker that can be easily teased by, you know, clinically would be, you know, looking into patient weight. And here again, data taken from a SHARM trial, we can see there's a correlation between. Um, cachexia, sarcopenia, subsequent weight loss, and outcomes. And here we can see patients who had a drop in their BMI or had a lower BMI, had a worse outcome, and had the less days alive outside of the hospital. Now, the implication of that is even, you know, those patients who had advanced heart failure and they get a VAD or a transplant, what is the implication of cachexia or sarcopenia post-advanced therapies? And this is a question that was answered almost a decade ago by this group where they completed a mini nutrition assessment questionnaires pre vad or pre-transplant. And they stratified the patient to three categories, malnourished, at risk of malnutrition, or adequately, uh, or adequate, adequately nourished. And here we can see that a cohort of patients who were undernourished, whether malnourished or at risk, had a worse outcome post-VAD or post-transplant. Now, the good news is that you know, those patients who are undernourished or malnourished, the good news is that post-VAD, for the most of them, you know, whether they had low BMI or normal BMI, they do gain back their weight and they don't necessarily gain fat weight or adipose tissue by, you know, and we've seen that very often where VAT patients, uh, patients with advanced therapy, where they get a VAT, we see a significant rise in their weight, but they gain their adipose and also they gain back their muscle mass. In this particular study, we've seen like almost six pounds of muscle mass gain within three months post VAT implant. implant. Another clinical marker is intolerance to medical therapy. So as the LV function worsen, the pumping function of the heart worsen, there is an upregulation of the renin angiotensin system and activation of the sympathetic system. 
not uncommonly when we do a red heart catheter patient, we will see that their systemic vascular resistance is very high and it's a kind of a compensatory mechanism to maintain their blood pressure. And intolerance to a RAS blocker agent is an indicator that those patients' heart failure has progressed to a certain degree or significant degree. And this particular patient was from Brigham, published like over, a uh, over 10 years ago. But they did for like almost 250 patients with systolic heart failure, they stratified them into three cohorts. Those who are able to tolerate an ACE inhibitor on discharge, those who are not able to tolerate an ACE inhibitor on discharge, but did not need any inotropes, and the reason for not tolerating an ACE was a cardiorenal limitation. And what, I meant, what they meant with that is those patients were hypotensive, had an acute kidney injury, um, the exclusive patient who had angioedema with ACE or ARMS. The third cohort of patients are those who are intolerant to ACE inhibitor and were discharged on inotropes. And here we can see a, a tremendous drop in survival at one month and two months of follow-up in those who are intolerant to ACE inhibitor. And the worst outcome among those, although there are a few patients, but pretty much all of them died within four months of follow-up. Similar pattern was seen or was reported by the optimized heart failure registry, where it included a cohort of patients admitted with heart failure, and those who were um, who were not able to tolerate a beta blocker. And what I mean here is that the patients who were on the beta blocker admission and had their beta blocker stopped had a worse outcome upon 90 days of follow-up. A similar pattern but to a lesser degree was seen in patients who had heart failure, but were discharged off beta blocker. Um, another marker is high dose diuretics. So as the LV function worsened, there is uh, less perfusion to the kidneys, increase in fluid reabsorption over time. And many of those patients require higher and higher doses of diuretic. And here, those graphs summarize this two study. This included a cohort of patients on the outpatient side, where we can see a significant rise in mortality with escalating doses of diuretic. And a similar pattern was seen in inpatient setting where higher dose of IV diuretic was associated with a higher mortality. Now, moving to the uh, biochemical marker. Um, now, the, we often talk about cardiorenal syndrome. Um, it is a spectrum of diseases that includes different subtypes. And what it is, it's there's a very close relationship between the heart and the kidney. So they do affect each other in different ways. And for the purpose of my presentation today, you know, for the most part, cardiorenal syndrome type one or two, where you know there's acute cardiac insult or chronic cardiac insult will lead to an acute kidney injury or worsening kidney function. This is a cohort of patients, stable heart failure patients who are seen uh, in Alberta, Canada upon referral to the heart failure clinic, and they collect the baseline renal function. And here we can see that over time, those who had a low GFR did worse on follow-up. A similar pattern was reported in the DITCH trial. Again, we can see a lower GFR was associated with a higher mortality. And this is very important, not just for prosnotication. It's important when we assess patients for, for advanced therapies. And this slide was taken from the Intermax registry where renal function predicted the outcome post-VAD implant. So those who had, uh, for the most part, stage 3B or higher chronic kidney disease had the worst outcome compared to those who had no chronic kidney disease or mild chronic kidney disease. And here we can see patient on dialysis, although a very small number of patients, they did the worst. And that's why, you know, we patients with on dialysis or stage 4 or 5 chronic kidney disease are not considered for that, mainly because of worst outcome post implant. Another frequent biomarker we use in clinic are natriuretic peptide, which are you know, uh, hormones re released from chronic myocytes in response to increased uh, to, um, wall stress. And you know, a certain value or one value per se doesn't mean a whole lot. I think what matters most is the trend over time and then what their BMP is when they're really decongested. And this is, this is something that was studied by this group where they had 180 patients admitted with a heart failure deservation. And you're talking about systolic heart failure deservation. And what they did is try to fight them initially based on their admission uh, NTA-proBNP. And they used the median NTA-proBNP. And here we can see there's no difference in the outcome if we use the admission NTA-proBNP. What they subsequently did is try to fight those patients based on their discharge NTA-proBNP using the median value. And those who are able to have a lower NTA-proBNP on discharge had an improved survival. 
uh, the point of this study is like decongesting those patients is key in improving survival. Um, very often we do see patients who are very congested where we try to dare them, but can you function improve? And in some occasions we've seen patient backing off on diuresis and discharging them congested. The barrier of fact is chronic congestion will lead to worse outcome. So having somebody with a slightly higher kidney function compared to someone with a better kidney function but congested, usually the one where decongested will do better in the long run. A similar pattern was reported by the Paradigm trial. And this is the study who um, randomized patients to enalapril versus Interesto. So those were able to achieve a low nt pro vmp defined as 1,000 picogram per milliliter had a better outcome upon three years of survival. And this was irrespective of the treatment arm, whether they received enalapril or secubitril velsartan. Now, moving to the imaging part, you know, all our patients get an echocardiogram. There is a very strong correlation between injection fraction and cardiovascular mortality, whether it's due to sudden cardiac death, heart failure death, fatal MI. A similar pattern is seen in, uh, with left ventricle and diastolic dimension. So as there is more remodeling or LV remodeling, the LV cavity will become bigger. And this has been, this did correlate with worse outcomes. So here we can see those who had an LV and diastolic dimension of more than 75 millimeter did worse than those who had a smaller LV cavity. Also the size of the LV cavity is very helpful to have a sense of how chronic the cardiomyopathy has been. So someone presented with an LVDD of 80 or 90 millimeter, this is somebody who had a cardiomyopathy for a while versus somebody presenting with an LVDD of 45 or 50 or 55 millimeter. This is somebody whose cardiomyopathy is relatively recent and their chance of potential recovery could be good once the insult is identified and addressed. Now with a large LV cavity, you know, many of those patients will develop functional mitral regurgitation. Again, it's another marker of LV remodeling. And not an often patient refer to the structural clinic, the matrix clinic for mitral clip or mitral intervention. They do have features of advanced therapies. And over the last couple of years, between Taylor and myself, we referred like close to somewhere between five and eight patients for a or transplant. And those were patients who were initially referred for a mitral valve intervention. Now, with LV remodeling and increased LV pressure, many of those patients will develop uh, post capillary pulmonary hypertension. And over time, this will lead to increased PPR potentially and can worsen right ventricular ejection fraction. And in this particular study, it's an MRI study where you know, they did an MRI on 250 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. We can see a very strong correlation between a drop in eject low ejection fraction and low RVEF, mainly because almost 20 to 40% of the RV contractility counts from the septum. And when they stratified the patient based on their ejection fraction, those who had a low or poor RV function did worse in the long run. Again, this is very important when assessing patients for VAD therapy, mainly because RV failure, post VAD, is very common, irrespective of the pump or the ear era. So even with you know older pump, the pulsatile pump, continuous pump, even with the heart rate three, which is relatively the newest pump we have, the risk of developing RV failure post VAD is somewhere between twenty to thirty percent. And um, one major or one intervention we make sure to do is to decongest those patients before they go into OR. Uh, mainly, we know that congestion in this, in this particular study was defined as a right atrial pressure or a CVP of more than 14. So those who had, those who were congested, the risk of developing RV failure was almost 2.5 times higher than those who were very well optimized. And again, the mortality was higher, not significantly, but there's a strong trend toward increased mortality and the risk of the right ventricular assist support, uh, right ventricular assist device increases. Now, the two tests we do to assess functional uh, capacity or you know, two markers of, um, two functional markers are six minute walk test and a car cardiopulmonary stress test. Six minute walk test is a very good test, simple test to do. We just pretty much see how far a patient can walk during six minutes. Um, usually a change of 50 meters or more is considered significant and it gives kind of a global assessment about the overall functional capacity of the patient. This data was taken from the ESCAPE study. And here we can see sedentary patients did the worst. And as you know, when patients here were divided into four quartile, those who were able to walk over 290 meters did the best. 
and as you know, the copper distance dropped, we can see the mortality did increase. After we perform copper pulmonary stress test, and we look into two markers, one of them or two measurements, one of them the peak oxygen uptake and the VE VCO2 of or the ventilatory efficiency, which is inversely related to cardiac output. So the higher your VE VCO2, the lower your cardiac output is usually. And in this graph, per se, we can see in a cohort of patients with heart failure, as their VE VCO2 increased, their survival dropped over time. Now, when we combine both markers, the peak VO2 and the VE VCO2, it has more prognostic value. So if both of those parameters are normal, this cohort of patient will do much better than a comparable cohort of patients whose both parameters are abnormal. So, you know, any patients who are sedentary for whatever reason, um, or who sometimes underestimate their symptoms, getting a CPAT has some prognostic value, uh, per se. Now, different uh, algorithms or different uh, mnemonics have been published. The most common one uh, used is I Need Help. This was published by the ACC uh, a couple of years ago. And it helps you know, to remind physicians like what to look for or when to refer patients for advanced therapies. A couple of years ago, we did put uh, this kind of uh, graph and um, share that with referring physicians just to help them identify when and who to refer for advanced therapies. Um, now, when we, the question that comes up now, since after we covered um, marker for advanced therapy, the question that comes up is when to pull the trigger and evaluate this patient for that. So a patient has, you know, high risk features referred to see a heart failure physician. The question is when to proceed with, with that therapy or heart transplantation. Again, as your function capacity worsen, as your LD function worsen, you know, we, it's very important to identify when to pull the trigger because NYC class three or four, it's a very heterogeneous group of patients. So class three is gonna be, you know, ambulatory uh, patients, not on any stroke for the most part. Class four could be stratified to two group of patients, those who are ambulatory, and those will be intermax profile four or five, or those who are pretty much in shock providing anotropes, or like, in, or those on critical, critical shocks, that'll be class, uh, class one. For the most part, the patients who end up getting a VAD therapy are those between uh, profile one and three, and increasingly over the last few years, we've had more patients with profile four getting VAD therapy. Now, uh, looking into the outcome, uh, it's very important once a patient with advanced heart failure uh, is identified, it's important to get that evaluated or getting this patient to VAT therapy sooner than, rather than later. And what I mean with that, you know, the lower your intermac profile, the worse the outcome. So those who are profile one, and this is the red line in here, the survival is significantly lower that profile two, which is significantly lower than profile three. And for those between profile four and seven, their outcome is pretty similar to those who are, uh, of profile three. And more often than not, patient with the profile one, they end up getting a temporary mechanical scrapping support before getting into more permanent support because most of those patients have end organ dysfunction, whether it's kidney failure, shock liver, so on and so forth. The question that comes up is there any utility in evaluating patient with a uh, ambulatory patient of anutrope? And here we're talking about intermax profile four to seven. And this is a question that was answered partially by the Medamax, which is the registry. Um, it's Medamax stands for the medical arm for um, mechanically assisted circulatory support. So this registry included close to 170 patients. Uh, they had high risk features. Um, none of those patients were on anutropes. Uh, they had one hospitalization for heart failure within the past year. So what they did, they followed those patients over one year. And then here we can see at a one-year mark, almost half of the patients were alive on medical therapy. A fifth of the patients died. Uh, a fifth of the patient died. So that's almost 22%. 50% ended up getting VAD, and 50% ended up getting uh, transplant. Now, the when they looked into survival free of VAD as a rescue therapy, here we can see that Intermax 4, which is a red line in here, almost 60% of the patients with Intermax profile 4 ended up getting a VAD, and only 39% were alive without a VAD at one year of follow-up. 
So the question that comes up, would that therapy beneficial or indicated in patient with Dramax 4? Subsequent study uh, called the Roadmap, it's a prospective observational non-randomized study. It included 200 patients. You know, half of them had a heart rate 2, LVAD, and the other half received optimal medical therapy. And their inclusion criteria included, again, some high-risk features, like more than one heart failure hospitalization the past year, and a limited functional capacity, in here defined by you know, six-minute walk distance of less than 300. And at one year of follow-up, we can see that survival and the cohort of patients who received the VAD was higher than those on medical therapy. Now, this came at a cost. So those who received the VAD had more side effects or more complications. And here we're talking about drive-line infection, jab bleeding, um, so on and so forth. However, if the primary endpoint of the study was, you know, being alive at 12 months on the original therapy and an improvement in functional capacity here, defined by, you know, increasing the six-minute walk distance by 75 meters. And the primary endpoint was achieved more in the LVAT cohort compared to the medical therapy. Also, you know, among the 103 patients who received medical therapy, now, you know, 18 of those end up getting a VAD. So their heart failure symptoms progressed to a point where they needed to be evaluated for advanced therapies. Now, despite increased in, you know, complication post VAD, those who received the VAD had a significant improvement in their functional capacity. So almost 77% of the patients, you know, had class one or two at 12 months of follow up versus, you know, 29% on the medical arm had class two, almost none had class one. Uh, their uh, quality of life improved using, using the visual analog scale. So this was more significant in the VAD group and they had less um, uh, depression. And this was assessed using the PHQ-9 score. So this was, you know, there was more change in the score among the cohort of patients who received the VAD. And I think, you know, with, with a roadmap study publication, we've seen more uh, Intermax 4 patients receiving VAD therapy. Now, there are three pumps, like, currently available, or I shouldn't say that. There's, there's three pumps you might see during your clinical practice. The heart rate 2, which we don't implant anymore. The HVAD, which we don't implant anymore as of a year ago. The company decided to withdraw the pump, mainly because of increased thromboembolic uh, event. And the heart rate 3, which is currently the only pump available. And we cannot talk about that therapy and the outcome without comparing that to heart transplant, which is the gold standard. So if we look into the outcome of patient who receives a heart, and you know the median survival for adult is almost clo it's close to 11 years. So by 11 years post transplant, half of the patient who receives a heart will die. Um, so per se, the heart transplant is not a cure. It's to a certain degree they're replacing one problem with the other. Um, now, when we compare the transplant, uh, when we compare the VAD outcome to transplant, and here we're looking at two years of follow-up. So this is including all patients with advanced therapies. So if we do nothing for those patients, right? So more than 90% will die by year two of follow-up. With the older pump, you know, the survival is a bit better, but not great. Now, as technology improved and our understanding of how the pump work and how to care for those patients, you know, the rate of complication dropped. The mechanical failure for the pump has dropped significantly. And here we can see, you know, the two-year two survival for transplant is close to 82%. The heart made three, it's close to 80%. So it's close. And for the first two years, the survival will kind of track between transplant and VAD. It's like beyond two years where we see the transplant being superior to VAD therapy. This is uh, this slide was taken for the momentum three trial five years follow up. So the momentum trial is the um, the major heart rate three trial where they compare the heart rate three to the heart rate two. Um, so here we can see the five year survival for the heart rate three is close to sixty percent. It is superior to the heart rate two, but still it's inferior to them transplants. So the five year survival for heart transplants goes to seventy two percent. So as I said. So the two years time point survival is pretty similar, but beyond that, we can see heart transplant being superior to, to that therapy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that therapy will improve survival, will improve quality of life, but this comes with at the cost to a certain degree. 
So the most common complication that we encounter are pump infection or driveline related infection. So at one year of post implant, you know, almost 25 to 30% percent of patients will have some kind of an infection, whether it's a driveline related, it's a bacteremia or a pump related infection. GI bleeding continues to be a frequent complication. Uh, almost 20 to 25 of patients, 20 to 25 percent of patients will have a uh, mucosal bleeding or non-surgical bleeding, mainly GI bleeding. And almost um, 13 to 20 percent of patients will have um, a, a stroke. Now the complication rate and maybe pump thrombosis or stroke has dropped significantly. So pump thrombosis inside the house of the pump is almost non-existent for the HeartMate 3 compared to the HeartMate 2 or the HVAD. And that has to do with the better uh, pump design that has a better hemocompatibility profile. So we haven't seen any clotting inside the housing of the pump per se. We still see some clotting inside the inflow cannula or the outflow cannula, but it's not as often as with the HeartMate 2 or the HeartMate 3. And with this thrombo thrombotic event with the HeartMate 3, that translated to less strokes. So we've seen, we are seeing less ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke now with the HeartMate 3 compared to the other two pumps. Now, GI bleeding continues to be, to be an issue, still pretty common. And we, we just concluded a study like less than a year ago where we are assessing the utility of the role of aspirin in reducing thromboembolic events in patients with a HeartMate 3. So the way where the field is heading is in a year or two, we might get rid of the aspirin and those patients will be only on Coumadin and hopefully this will contribute to less uh, bleeding event post pump implant. Now, the, despite all those complications, the quality of life improved quite a bit. So we can, and this is using the Euroqual uh, visual analog scale and the KCCQ instrument. So we can see a significant improvement in the quality of life as soon as three months post implant. And this, this those scores remains pretty consistent up to five years of follow-up, which is very important for patients. Now, looking at our own data at the University of Michigan, so this included uh, almost 16 year worth of data. Or, uh, we can see our survival and you know, our sense in the red, blue is the you know, uh, national data. So we can see our survival is superior to the national average. Actually, our five-year survival is close to you know, 60%, which is pretty close to what has been reported in the Momentum trial. Our risk of infection, post-pop implants um, are lower. So freedom from infection is significantly lower than what has been reported nationally. And our risk of strokes tracks pretty much the national data. Again, uh, our patient tracks national data in terms of functional capacity improvement, post pump implant, and in terms of improved quality of life. Now, over the last, I would say, four years, uh, we have seen a trend. Uh, it changed the, the trend of pump implant, and that has to do with the uh, United Network of uh, Organ Sharing, or UNOS, allocation changes. So when somebody is listed for transplant, pre-2018, they were listed as status 1A, 1B, or status 2, depending on how sick they are. In 2018, UNOS changed the allocation system. So now, patient listed for transplant, they are placed, they get a status 1 to status 6, with status 1 being the highest level of equity. Historically, LVAT patient used to be status 1B with the old classification. Now they're listed as status 4 with a newer classification. So with the introduction of the new classification in 2018, more centers across the whole country, I would say, are using more temporary support, which would put people at a higher status level and get them to transplant sooner. With that, historically, almost 50% of patients pre-2018 were getting the LVAD as destination therapy, and the other 50% as a bridge to transplant or as a bridge to decision. But with the you know, allocation system changed, in 2018, now the majority of the patients are getting LVAD therapy as destination therapy, and we're seeing less and less bridge to transplant or bridge to decision strategy. Again, here we can see the number with the LVAD listed for transplant has dropped significantly over the last few years compared to you know, 2018 and before that. And at the same time, here we've seen an increase in the use of temporary support. So 
free allocation system, a post allocation system, we had a jump from like eight to nine percent use of balloon pump as a bridge to transplant. In 2019, this number went up to 27 percent, and now I would guess it's even higher than that. Same thing. There's an uptick in the use of Ampella as a temporary mechanical security support as a bridge to transplant, and this is there's an upward trend in Ampella support uh, use. Now, what's the future? What's the future holding? Um, so there are a few pumps in, uh, in the pipelines uh, which uh, are being developed and being studied. One of them is the Eva Heart 2. Um, there is actually a clinical trial right now. It's called the Competence Trial. It's comparing the Eva Heart 2 to the HeartMate 3. Uh, the difference between the HeartMate 3 and the um, Eva Heart 2, so there is a um, tipless and flow cannula. So the risk of a clot building up in here is smaller. There's a swivel here where the surgeon can, you know, change the position of the pump to, um, you know, to, to, to fit well in the chest. And then um, supposedly the Eva Heart 2 has a, a better hemocompatibility profile and less shear stress and less hemolysis compared to the HeartMate 3. So we, the trial is enrolling. Um, the anticipate, anticipated date to complete enrollment is in 2024. So hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have some data about this pump. Another pump, which pretty much tested on animals, there's no human study for this one yet, it's called the Torvad LVAD, which has an interesting design. So this is the inflow cannula here, and this is the outflow graft, and it has an epicardial lead that's placed surgically. And the way the pump will work, let's say this is the inflow and this is the outflow. So it syncs with the native function of the heart or the heartbeat it can be in synchronous or asynchronous mode. So with every beat, the sensor, the epicardial lead will detect like, you know, that the heart is trying to eject and then it will move those magnet and it will suck out of the blood from the inflow and then push it through the outflow. And then it pushes the other magnet forward. So, um, this has been implanted um, in animal studies in sheep. It has a, supposedly it has less shear stress. It requires less energy and they haven't seen much hemolysis with it, at least in animal study. So, but you know, this one still have a, a, um, a drive line. So it's not totally implantable. Uh, another one in the, pipeline is called Corion LVAD, which is a totally implantable pump. It has to a certain degree the same concept as the HeartMate 3. It's a full, uh, uh, has a full maglev. So there's a magnet in here that keeps the this pinner in place. It's totally implantable. So there's no drive line coming to the skin. So that should drop the risk of infection significantly. The way it's designed, it consumes way less energy. And those patients can pretty much be totally unhooked from this transcutaneous uh, charger for like three hours. So they can go swim, shower, they're not hooked to a drive line or any devices. Um, again, still work in progress. There's no animal study, uh, there's no human studies on that yet. The concept is less energy, com uh, less energy use, um, better hemocompatibility, com less hemolysis. Still wait, we'll have to wait and see. The third one is called a core wave LVAD. It's a pulsatile pump. Again, it syncs to the native heart function. So there's a membrane in here, there's some coils, and there's kind of a magnet that move this ring up and down and move this membrane. And it helps to provide some kind of pulsatility. And that should help with, you know, causing less vulvar factor, factor, factor degradation and potentially down the road, less GI bleeding. Um, this pump, pump have a drive line. Um, it's not totally implantable. And then the last one I would like to point out is called the fine heart, which is a pump that is placed uh, epicardial. So they make an incision, placed epicardially, and it has an interesting concept. So it's pointed toward the aortic valve. So it will suck the blood from the bottom part and just push it through the aortic valve. It kind of assists the native function of the heart. It's totally plantable. Uh, it's transcutaneously charged. Um, there's no, I don't, I'm not aware of any 
implant in the United States. It's a French company that developed this bump. And the Heartbeat 3, per se, they are in the process of developing a totally implantable LVAD, but that's still a work in progress. There's no human studies yet. And so in conclusion, heart failure is a progressive disease. It's important to identify early markers for advanced heart failure and for timely referral. Um, as of today, heart transplant remains the treatment of choice for suitable candidate. Uh, durable MCS is a valid alternative to transplant. Uh, LVAD therapy is well indicated for patients with Intermax profile two to four and profile one, but for the most part, those patients require uh, temporary support to reverse end organ dysfunction prior to proceeding to LVAD therapy. In the, few years, in the coming few years, we will see more pumps on the market. Hopefully, we'll have less adverse event uh, and more penetration, more acceptance, like patient acceptance and physician acceptance for, for those therapies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abbas. That was that was terrific. Um, I think you, you showed the uh, University of Michigan data for uh, outcomes with left ventricular assist devices looked favorable compared to the the nation. Yes. What do you think the reason is for that? So. I think that's multifactorial. So I think we do we do a very good job optimizing patients post their implant early on, and following those patients very closely too. Uh, over the last you know few years, we did come up with different algorithms to minimize complications. You know we changed our strategy how we you know uh, do let's say drive line dressing to minimize infections. A few years ago, we came up with an algorithms to prevent GI bleeding, uh, and. We also came up with different algorithm to how to treat GI bleeding systematically. I think the protocol we've we've put together over the last you know, ten years did contribute to our favorable outcome. Yeah. Uh, first, a comment, which is fabulous. What a you know, it was a wonderful tour and a journey, um, and very exciting future for for the technology. So thank you for that wonderful um, presentation. So how do we um, uh, just, I'm thinking more strategically, you know, for all of these advances, we've seen a commoditization of care. For instance, stents used to be placed in only certain centers. Now everybody does them. Now you don't even need to be an on-site surgical center. We've seen with um, um, TAVR, for instance, there's a bit of commoditization of that where sort of everybody's doing that. What's the future for VAD? in our state or in our nation, are there gonna only be certain centers or <clears throat> is there gonna be a commoditization of VAD um, placement and care? That's a very good question. So over the last few years, many centers have been offering. Uh, so initially most, only the centers that would offer VAD would offer transplant. And that's, you know, early on. Over the last few years, we've seen centers offering VAD as destination therapy only. The challenge most many of the centers are facing right now is one, their volumes are down, and then two, their outcome hasn't been great. I think moving forward, we're gonna go back, you know, to the model where most of the VAT therapy is gonna happen in bigger center that offer transplant. Okay, thank thank you. I mean, it's it's hard to know the future. We don't in this country always do things in the most organized way as yeah. it should be with centers of excellence, but thank you. Abbas, the, um, the other thing that really looks like it changed over the past four or five years is the proportion of VADs that are going in as destination therapy. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to uh, the types of patients that end up with destination therapy? Uh, in 2023? Yes. And how so, they differ? Correct. From that, that's a very good question because now everybody with advanced our heart failure, we try to get them to transplant. I mean, that has been across the nation. And the cohort of patients who are getting VAD as destination therapy now tend to be older patients with more comorbid condition. 
Uh, if you go back and look to pre-2018, it's a more you know, heterogene heterogeneous group of people who got the VAD, them, whether it's for you know, uh, TT, BTT, or registered transplant. So now the cohorts of patients who are getting the VAD, mainly as DT, are older patients with more comorbid conditions, and their chance of being considered for transplant in the future is very low. Uh, it remains to be seen like what their outcome is going to be a few years from now because now that people are getting that have more comorbid condition than they did a few years ago, I would say. And this has been pretty much our experience, but I would assume that's across the centers, other centers too. I know you've made uh, quite an effort to uh, give talks to other programs in the mm -hmm. state of Michigan. And what is it you tell them as far as like when a patient should be referred for advanced therapy consideration? Yes. So we we do. We did actually come up with a kind of a pamphlet that would pretty much summarize what, what I went over. So what we've been telling referring physician is, you know, any patients that you have with intolerant to medical therapy, frequent hospitalizations, this is somebody who should be seen by a heart failure specialist. And this is somebody, you know, even if he does not need therapy right now, having a relationship with, with an advanced heart failure therapy center is very helpful because once this patient gets to a point where he needs a VAD or a transplant, he's already well known to that center and then we can proceed with treatment. Because not uncommonly what happens is we get patients who are referred very late in the process. So they're referred with anterior disease or cirrhotic or they're too old per se. And then they're, you know, at that time, they're not a candidate for any treatment. What are your thoughts about the uh, the change in the list the, the listing criteria for statuses and whether that's serving our patients well uh, to be undergoing balloon pump placement or impella placement in other centers? Yes, so that, that that's a very good question. I mean, what has been published so far, the outcomes in terms of post transplant for those who are bridge with stepper support is now worse you know, post-2018 compared to 2018, it will be very interesting to see in two years what the outcomes look like. Uh, because, at our, you know, we've seen some complication with that for support. Um, and I'm pretty sure that other centers are seeing the same problem. And the question of whether UNOS will revise their listing criteria in the future, that remains to be answered. I'm looking at the report the uh, chat, and I'm not seeing any questions there. I'm looking at the chat, and I'm not seeing any questions there. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. I think really um, was really well organized, and really, um, I always learn a lot when I listen to my colleagues, uh, particularly Abbas. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.